When we think about what characterizes a martial art movie, a lot of elements come to mind. Rapid fire fight choreography, animal styles, weapons, and acrobatics are all common traits of the martial art film. But there's one other element that adds an aesthetically pleasing touch to our favorite action scenes, and that is high dynamic kicking. It seems as though high dynamic kicks were with us since the beginning of martial arts cinema, but that's not necessarily true. And so I want to investigate who it was who first innovated the dynamic kicking we've come to associate with martial arts cinema, and how that came to influence future action filmmakers all the way up to modern day. Now before we look at martial arts cinema, I'd like to take a moment to look at the history of kicking in martial arts itself. Northern Chinese styles like Tan Tui were renowned for high kicks, which weren't your typical Korean or Japanese or Thai kicks, but rather more fluid kicks designed for flexibility rather than power. Meanwhile, Shotokan Karate in the early 1900s was developing a very different kicking system, which not only had more power due to the chambering action before the kick was released, but these kicks also made an aesthetically pleasing geometric shape in the air when they were executed with proper form. During the Japanese occupation of Korea, many Koreans were studying Shotokan and began adapting those kicks into a variety of systems, or kwans, which all came together eventually into Taekwondo. Hapkido added in the flowiness of Tan Tui kicks to give it its own unique style. All these martial arts schools were eager to show off these kicks in demonstrations, and so they began perfecting the shapes of these kicks, or their lines, so that the audience could better appreciate them. Now, there's also a credible theory that the French brought the kicking style of savate to Japan, but it's debatable how much this really influenced Shotokan, and we might assume that the French picked up their dynamic kicking while exploring Southeast Asia. And so on that note, we look at Thailand in the 1950s, and we see that the kicks in Muay Thai were becoming very dynamic and powerful, and by the 1960s, we basically see the modern-day Thai roundhouse kick already being developed. And in nearby Malaysia, we see dynamic kicking in the game of Sepak Takra, which is a sort of volleyball played with your feet. This game goes back to the 1800s, but was formalized as a sport in the mid-20th century, and it's here when we start seeing dynamic kicking developing in sport. Now, with World War II, American military personnel begin to be stationed in Japan, and later in Korea during the Korean War, and they start learning these kicking styles and bringing them back to America and combining them with boxing. Chuck Norris is one of these veterans who brought Korean kicking back to the States. And so we start seeing dynamic kicking moving away from mere demonstrations and into competitive martial arts. And all this is happening before 1970. What's so fascinating about all of this is that despite all of these dynamic kicks developing in these martial arts systems throughout the 50s and 60s, we don't see these kicks anywhere in films, except in these documentaries. Starting with Chinese martial arts cinema, the action there was still mostly derived from southern styles, and what kicking there was was very basic. Looking across the pond in Japanese cinema, there's almost no evidence of kicking in films at all. Most of their action cinema was sword films, which were great films, but there's no Shotokan kicking and no ninja kicking. Now, I did manage to find two Japanese films with kicks. One was called Karate Hand of Death from 1961, and this was actually made by an American team. But most of the kicks are part of a martial art demo in the middle of the film, and they're the same kicks that you see in the documentary footage from the time. And uh, the villain at the end is clearly doubled by one of these kickers who's throwing very slow but actually pretty good kicks. And the other one was a Sonny Chiba movie from 1966, and it doesn't look like he's going to be doing much impressive kicking here, but then he throws this perfect sidekick. So even though these kicks are all performed well, they're just not portrayed in an interesting way. In Korea, the action was also just mostly sword play with no signs of Taekwondo or Hapkido kicks anywhere. And in America, we do have some martial arts in the 60s, but it's mostly just Judo or Jiu Jitsu. And the kicking is really basic, so it seems as though martial art kicks hadn't quite caught on in cinema yet. Now, the Green Hornet TV show is one exception, but we're going to get to that later. So even though we see high dynamic kicking in sports, in martial arts, and in military training, we're not seeing it in cinema. And it would take one of two people to come along and basically pave the way for kicking in action films. We have to wait until 1971 when two different movies come out around the same time, both using high dynamic kicking. 
The first film we'll look at is Billy Jack, starring Tom Laughlin, who also wrote, produced, and directed the film. The reason this movie and this scene are so famous is because nobody had done dynamic kicks like this in an action scene before. In fact, the other actors in the scene probably had never seen kicks like this before either, because Lachlan's stuntman, Bong Su Han, is literally kicking some of these guys in the face. So even though some of the kicks don't have the clean lines that we've come to expect from martial art films, you have to give credit to Lachlan and Bong Su Han for introducing kicking to martial arts cinema, at least in America. Because... At the very same time in the year of 1971, another film was being shot on the other side of the world in Thailand with an up-and-coming martial arts star, Bruce Lee. The Big Boss was Lee's first contract film with Golden Harvest, and it's in this film where we get to see Bruce Lee's special kicking style really come to life. Now, Bruce's kicks in The Big Boss look just as good, if not better, than Bong Su Han's kicks in Billy Jack. And I think that that's for a number of reasons. First of all, obviously, Bruce was very talented. But also, Bruce knew exactly where to put the camera so that these kicks would look good. They probably also had more time to shoot the action, which is a luxury in Hong Kong filmmaking that Lachlan didn't have when shooting Billy Jack. Now, Han Ying Git is credited as the martial art choreographer for the film. And Han Ying Git pioneered the, the trampoline jump, you know, the thing that you always see where a guy supposedly jump really high, and he was definitely of a certain time period. And Han Ying Git's choreography was very, very much the old kind of Chinese, a little, little bit posy, but not quiet. It's a little bit stiff. Uh, the rhythm is strange, right? It's that very 1960s style that was on the way out now that Bruce was coming into the picture because you see this in the end fight where the two of them are going against each other and it looks like they're speaking different languages when they're fighting. So there was probably some ego <laughs> between the two of them for sure, Han Yang Git being the veteran choreographer and Bruce Lee being this kind of new guy. Four years before he shot The Big Boss, Bruce had already made an impact in American culture as Kato in the Green Hornet TV series. Now, we all seem to remember Kato as exemplifying Bruce's brand of action, but if we look closely, his kicks are much more of the Chinese variety, lacking the strong shapes that they had later on in The Big Boss. So between The Green Hornet and The Big Boss, Bruce was developing his patented kicking style. The question is, where did he get those kicks from? In 1967, Bruce attends the Long Beach International Karate Championships and does his famous demonstration of his one-inch punch and two-finger push-ups. But what's interesting here is that his dynamic kicks are not being shown. The ones he does show are in his sparring demonstration, and those are pretty basic. Front kick, roundhouse, and side kick. That's about it. We don't really see any of the spinning hook kicks, the back kicks, or flying kicks that he would later be known for. Now, of course, it's possible that he was just sticking to the traditional Wing Chun curriculum, which is what he was teaching at the time. But given his career path, I can't believe for a second that he would hold these kicks back. So I don't think he actually knew how to do them yet, at least not well enough to show at a tournament. After this, we have footage of Bruce in his backyard, practicing kicks, doing stepping side kicks, and also doing spinning hook kicks. What he's doing is not necessarily training a technique. What he's doing is lining up the camera and after he does the attack against his partner of course he runs behind the camera to go see uh, how the shot looked which is exactly what you do when you're making okay, indie films and, and so I believe that this is evidence that Bruce was training to make his kicks appealing on camera not necessarily effective in real life and one of the martial artists that Bruce was training with was Chuck Norris and in his own words he said that he taught Bruce Lee high kicks and then I saw it started showing him all the various high kicks and he really fell in love with them and he became so good after about six months he could do them just about as well as I could and uh, then uh, like I say Bruce left for Hong Kong soon after to pursue his movie career. Now before we jump down Chuck Norris's throat let's try and qualify his statement. Chuck had been a veteran in the Korean War and when he was in Korea, he studied Tang Soo Do. He brought that back to the States. Now, Tang Soo Do was essentially Taekwondo at the time. And if we look at Chuck Norris's kicks during these tournaments, he's actually kicking pretty well. 
His roundhouse kicks are good. His side kicks are good. His stepping side kicks are good. He does some hook kicks. All that looks very good. You can't deny that he definitely had some kind of an impact when he came back from Korea to the United States. Now, Bruce, on the other hand, was coming to the States without any of that same kicking training. And I think that he was looking to Chuck Norris and the other Tongsudo and karate practitioners at the time who were doing these kicks for inspiration in order to create his own brand. But he wasn't just looking at them, he was also looking at the Korean stuntmen that he was working with in Hong Kong. Now, one of these Korean stuntmen, who was arguably the best kicker around at the time, was Wang In Sik. Now, when you look at Wang In Sik's kicks from Hapkido from 1972 and Win Taekwondo Strikes in 1973, you can tell that Wang In Sik has been kicking for a long time. This is no amateur kicker. When we look at the people that Bruce Lee interacted with, Chuck Norris and Wang In Sik, then it seems very plausible that he was getting his inspiration for his kicks from these guys. I suppose there's still something else that Bruce brought to the cinema, and that's theater. When you do theater, you know that there is one camera angle, and that's your audience. And your audience tends to be on one side. And so you can set up gags and movements so that it plays to the audience, and you can almost do it like a magic show. And I think this was one of Bruce's strengths. He had come from theater and Chinese cinema, and this only helped him as a filmmaker to develop an action style that was particularly strong on camera. But if we look back at the Billy Jack fight, we can kind of see how this American style of filmmaking didn't exactly accentuate Bong Su Han's kicks. Now, depending on where a camera is placed, a perfectly good kick might look bent or the foot will be in the wrong position. Bruce, on the other hand, to really make his action and his kicks look good, designed action with the camera in mind. His cinematic kicking style was a dance not just between performers, but between performer and camera. But usually, the stunt performer or the choreographer can't establish this relationship with the filmmaking team, and this is the common situation in American cinema. So action teams still have a lot of freedom to design whatever action they want, but they usually can't dictate where the camera goes, and they definitely don't dictate the edit. So it's no wonder that martial art demo teams actually thrive under these conditions because they've trained their kicks to look good from almost every single angle possible at tournaments. So these bigger and more acrobatic kinds of kicks lend themselves to being easier to shoot and edit in the American coverage style shooting system. But doing kicks like Bruce Lee, that requires a certain kind of filmmaking and it lends itself to being very special. And that's why Bruce's kicking is special. All right, so let's look at some more of Bruce's action and how it influenced later filmmakers. We'll start at uh, Fist of Fury, which is made right after The Big Boss. Bruce has this famous shot from the dojo scene, which would not be possible in American-style coverage shoot. They would have shot it from multiple angles. Some shots would have been good for some kicks, but here, Bruce just makes use of the one camera angle and lines up all the kicks with the stunt guy, so he looks like a tornado in the middle of the frame. It's really cool. You can see Jason Statham doing something very similar in The Transporter in 2002. He's got some great kicks in this later dojo scene. Again, lining up the performer here in a very cool way to take this nasty hook kick. The flying kick over the table needs a cutaway because making that kick hit its target properly in a wide shot would be really hard. You would have actually had to hit the guy. Now, Samo would go on to actually do a shot like this in 1978 in Warriors 2 with Casanova Wong, but he doesn't cut away and the kick lands on its mark. And he does it again in Dragons Forever and it's pretty devastating. And this kick against Yoshida is so cool, it's really inventive. You can see Jeff Speakman doing something similar in The Perfect Weapon later in 1991. Now Bruce's fight against Robert Baker is really tense. He's a little bit stiffer than Bruce, but he shoots him from the right angle so that his kicks look fine. The spin heel against Baker's chest is great. Samo did a shot like this in Shanghai, Shanghai in 1990. Now, the final shot, again, requires a cutaway because there's no way he could have lined up a sidekick properly with a proper reaction from Baker unless he used real contact. The only time I've seen a sidekick like that actually land its mark is when Tony Jaa did it in The Protector in 2005. All right, moving on to Bruce's third film with Raymond Chow, Way of the Dragon was directed by Bruce himself and has a ton of action. The sidekick is one of the most famous kicks ever put on film. He launches the guy by... Putting the kick slightly above center on him, you can see Van Damme doing this kick quite a bit in his career. Sam Hung did a great version of it in Millionaire's Express. Same technique, basically. Wong and Sick and Bob Wall have this scene later on where Bruce has them showing off their skills. So he was really trying to bring out the best in them. Bruce does this front leg side kick against Bob Wall, and it's real contact too, so it's it's kind of no nonsense. Front fake to roundhouse, another good technique, and it's shot so you can see the full line of the kick. 
and he lets Wong show off his stuff because, you know, Bruce gets to beat him with his own medicine. But this last sequence, Bruce is supposed to hit him with a hook kick, but the profile angle shows that it doesn't actually connect. But we don't really notice because it looks like a roundhouse kick and we tend to buy it. Donnie M was clearly taking a lot of inspiration from these kinds of kicks in movies like In the Line of Duty 4, Tiger Cage 1, Tiger Cage 2. And Bruce's finale against Chuck Norris is a classic. I mean, it's the first time you see Chuck in his full glory, and it's, it's shot wide like a samurai film, so you get to see the full geometry again of every kick. So this is probably the fight that first really fully expressed the cinematic language that Bruce was going for. And this sweep is so cool. It's not like a back sweep, but it's kind of this halfway sweep that clearly made contact. So again, guys like Sammo Hung would use shots like these all the time in later films. And Jackie Chan did it too in New Police Story in 2004. But maybe the best example is when Daniel sweeps the leg in The Karate Kid. Next on the list is Game of Death, which was unfinished because Bruce left mid-production to go work on Enter the Dragon, and then he died shortly thereafter. So most of Game of Death uses a double. And the only action we have that Bruce did is the pagoda scene, and most of this footage didn't even make it into the final film. The scene with Inosanto is mostly weapon work, Bruce dancing around him, playing with distancing. He's got his roundhouse here, and this is probably the only way to really shoot a right roundhouse kick on this side. So even though it's obscured, the effect is still there. His roundhouse spinning hook kick combo is really solid here, and Donnie Yen basically did the same thing in Tiger Cage 2. The next fight is with Jihan Jae, who is a well-known Hapkido man, and he does this shoddy kick but they kept it because I, I guess resetting the shelves in the background would have taken too long. I love how Bruce just stands there while James Tian gets thrown around. And it's a shame this movie was never finished. I bet it would have been his best. And the last scene is with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Again, this is more distancing choreography because Kareem's legs are so much longer than his. This is another great takedown, this time with a scissor. And I know we're focusing on kicks, but man, this punch windup is just awesome. Here's a jump hook kick, shot perfectly. The bottom leg is tucked. And this last roundhouse kick is lined up just perfectly. It almost looks like he makes contact, but maybe he didn't. And last, but definitely not least, is Enter the Dragon. And one of the greatest aspects of Enter the Dragon is how little editing there is during the fight scenes. The action plays out mostly in these long, wide takes, and just like in Way of the Dragon, you really get to see the geometry of the kicks, and I can only assume Bruce had a heavy hand in this. Now, Bruce has a stunt double here for the backflip kick. This is actually Yoon Hwa. And this is one of the many moves that inspired the character Law in the 1994 fighting game Tekken. Law's sidekick, roundhouse kicks, spin hook kicks, the whole character really, they're all inspired by Bruce. And even Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter had characters based on Bruce with a bunch of his signature kicks. One of the highlights is this insane groin kick against Bob Wall. That's something that Sammo did as well in Eastern Condors in 1985. Yeah, here's the stepping sidekick again, and then he plants this roundhouse kick right on his head, full contact. Tony Ja and his mentor Panna probably were inspired by this and made an entire career in Thailand out of real contact hits. The scenes in the underground lair are even better because there's literally no editing in these fights. Bruce just stages everything for the camera and he lets it all play out in these single takes and it's beautiful. Now I'm not exactly sure why he did this, but I have a suspicion that Bruce was getting annoyed at how long it took the American crew to set up shots. So. He would have just decided, screw it, let's just do one shot and move on. And these scenes are chambara quality as a result. And the finale with Sekin is tense, but it, it really almost becomes a horror movie when it goes into the, the mirror scene. Super powerful stepping sidekick. It launches the stuntman off camera, but you can see him raise his arm up to take the pressure of the kick under his armpit where the meat is, and that allows him to get pushed away. In the span of two years, Bruce had starred in five major films, but what's crazy is that when he started shooting Enter the Dragon, Americans only really knew him from The Green Hornet and Marlowe, and Fist of Fury had just come out, so he was just getting started. While he did experience fame in Hong Kong, he didn't live to see the international fame he would receive after Enter the Dragon released. Now, Bruce inspired a lot of martial arts stars, and I'm not talking about the knockoffs, but I mean guys like Bruce Liang, John Liu, Casanova Wong, Sun Chin, Tantao Liang, Sonny Chiba, Huang Zhang Li, just to name a few. But he didn't inspire these guys to learn how to kick. They had been kicking for years already. They just never put it on display. 
and no director or choreographer really knew what to do with these things. But it's like suddenly a light bulb goes off in the industry and everyone realizes that high dynamic kicks have cinematic power. And other stunt performers wanted in on the action too. Sammo Hung, Jackie Chan, and Yoon Byu began taking Hapkido, and we can see their kicks getting a lot better in the 80s as well. Really, after Bruce has pioneered this style of kicking, you essentially have the foundation of a kicking language in film. It makes me want to cry. And this language not only makes the kicks of martial artists look good, but actors and actresses who don't have any experience in kicking can start looking good as well. It's almost like it opens up the franchise for a new kind of action hero. And with the Hong Kong filmmakers and action stars coming over to Hollywood during the Hong Kong handover in 1997, America and the West finally adopts this language in its pure form, and we've mostly stuck to that. Now, sometimes martial art films still fall back on the old coverage shooting style, and the kicks will often suffer, but for every one of those, we get something like a Scott Adkins film. Not only are his physical skills awesome, we also get to see that same cinematic language that Bruce pioneered. Straight geometric lines, wide angles, minimal editing. Now, I know I skipped over a lot of other aspects of Bruce Lee's career, like his star power, his storytelling, his martial arts philosophy, the fact that his movies made $2 billion or whatever it is, but this video was only about Bruce's innovations and cinematic kicking. So next time you see your favorite action star throw a picture-perfect kick, maybe it'll give you another reason to think about the man, the artist, Lei Siu Long, Bruce Lee. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's my first breakdown video on the YouTube channel. Uh, let me know which ones you would like me to do in the future uh, because this was a lot of fun. So thank you all. Have a good day. Bye. Also, join me on Telegram at Eric Jacobus and check out my blog at ericjacobus.com where you can find supplementary material for this video.